Welcome to FACT's webinar called Raising Pigs in an Agroforestry System. Our presenter is Weston Lombard. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the webinar this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. So to begin with a few introductions, Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT is a, no a national nonprofit organization, and we are headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. This webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So please visit our website to learn more about um, our other farmer services, including our grants, scholarships, and mentorship, and to register for an upcoming webinar. So this time I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Weston Lom Lombard. Weston and his family own and operate Solid Ground Farm in southeastern Ohio. The farm specializes in soil conserving hilltop agricultural practices such as terrace, terrace agriculture, agroforestry, and holistic grazing. It's also home to the region's largest and most diverse forest garden. And I was lucky enough to see Weston present at the Ohio Ecological Food and Farming Association Conference this past February on this very topic. So we're absolutely honored to have him with us today. He will be available to answer your questions later in the webinar. And so with that, I am going to let Weston get started with his presentation. Weston, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Larissa. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I'm excited to chat with you. Um, so just a little bit about um, myself and my farm. Um, as Larissa said, 17 acres, diversified, small farm. Um, a lot of it is geared towards um, education, um, mixed with homesteading and some small commercial production we sell to one local health food store in the closest city and we also run like a small CSA but primarily we, we grow for ourselves and for events and uh, to feed kids at our summer camp. Um, I also teach at a local community college and we use the farm sort of as our land lab and learning center. Um, today, I do want to talk a lot about, <clears throat> I see that a lot of you do um, pastured pigs. Um, I'm really excited about agroforestry, and I'm going to try to convince you to incorporate, incorporate tree crops into your systems for a number of reasons. Um, I'll show some of my system and um, hopefully take some questions about what I'm doing and um, just, yeah, generally talk about the benefits of pigs and trees together. So to begin with, um, I want to talk about sort of the, the need for agroforestry as I see it. Um, soil loss is a, a really big issue um, worldwide. We actually lose um, topsoil. The, the size of the state of Indiana every year is washed away. And this is primarily as a result of um, sort of conventional agricultural practices and overgrazing. Anytime the land is bare and exposed to the elements, especially strong rain events, um, it it washes you know down into the gullies. I'm sure you have observed this in the past. Um, so anyway, um, with a growing population and a growing demand for food this problem might only exacerbate if we continue with conventional agricultural practices. Um, however, there are alternatives, one of which is agroforestry. Um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Just to, to, make, to make a point, um, soil formation can be a very slow process um, by just plants growing um, without much intervention, it, it can take 100 years to create an inch of topsoil. An inch of topsoil can be washed away in several months during large rain events. So um, it's a very precious and um, yes, resource we must conserve. Time to advance to the next slide here. Okay, so. 
um, anything we can do to um, keep the soil covered um, using sort of a natural forest as a model, there's always at least um, you know the dust layer on top of the soil, um, the leaves from the trees fall and protect both from falling rain and um, and from from sun from baking the soil. So whether you have living plants like pasture in your soil or a mulch layer or an actual leaf layer, anything you can do to protect the soil um, from erosion is is helpful. Um, this is particularly important on sloped land. The steeper the land, obviously, the more prone it is to erode, and the more, I guess, localized your rain events are. Um, any big rain event is a potential problem. My property, in particular, is is so steep I can hardly um, drive a tractor on it, which is one reason I've I've gotten into tree crops and trying to develop systems that that need less um, less less mowing and and maintenance. Um, okay, so why why tree crops? Um, so for one, they have really uh, deep, strong root systems that help hold the soil in place. Um, secondly, you only need to disturb the soil once, and then for the life of the trees, <clears throat> you can grow a ground cover or um, mulch, or you know you don't have to disturb the soil a second time. So you don't have the annual tillage that you have with conventional agricultural systems. Um, in addition, um, trees provide wildlife habitat um, and a bunch of ecosystem services. Um, so trees do things like provide a uh, net cooling effect. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture says that um, having a, a healthy shade tree is equivalent to running 10 room size air conditioners for 20 hours a day. And by effectively placing trees, say, around your house, you can reduce your cooling bill by up to 50%. Trees also um, improve water quality. There's less, less runoff and erosion and more recharging of the groundwater supply. Um, wooded areas help prevent the transport of sediment and chemicals into streams. Um, they also help conserve water by shading the ground, which leads to less evaporation. Um, trees also produce oxygen. One acre of forest, um, as it absorbs six tons of carbon dioxide, it also puts out four tons of oxygen. So this is enough to meet the annual needs of 18 people. So by growing forests, we're helping to sequester carbon and produce more oxygen. Um, most agricultural systems are sort of a net producer of of CO2 in some way. As you till the soil, a lot of that carbon in the soil oxidizes and goes into the air. Um, so instead of releasing carbon constantly, I'm trying to develop a system that helps put that carbon back back into the ground as it protects the soil from erosion as well. Um, so what is agroforestry? Um, is just incorporating trees for the many benefits I listed, but also for um, increasing farm production. So whether that's actually getting crops directly from the trees or creating some sort of benefit for livestock or even shading crops. Um, there's a bunch of different ways trees can can help your farm system. And I want to go through these briefly, um, just the general forms of agroforestry, and then we'll talk more specifically about um, what I'm what I'm doing. Um, so the first type of agroforestry um, is just using trees for what are called boundary systems. Um, Riparian buffers are a great example. I talked about how trees can slow the slow erosion. They can also um, stop agricultural runoff and prevent um, a lot of chemicals and fertilizers from getting into waterways. Um, so there are 
there are great uh, grant programs. I think it's mostly like tax relief programs to plant um, waterways on your farm into riparian buffers is through the soil and water conservation districts. So that's something worth looking into. Um, uh, for pigs, fortunately, um, wetland areas and along along waterways is some of the preferred habitat for pigs. So incorporating trees in these areas can be can be helpful. Um, trees can also be used in boundary systems as uh, hedges and living fences. Um, this is and that's something you know one of the reasons that we have multiflora rows in the United States um, was an attempt to uh, create living hedges. Um, but there are other potential species that could be used. It's commonly been done with Osage orange in the U.S. and uh, I think there's potential using mulberry and black locust, Osage orange, um, other fast-growing trees to create boundary systems that also provide some sort of benefit to the livestock, whether it's edible fruit, leaves, or seed pods of some sort. Uh, windbreaks, um, stressed crops, uh, stressed livestock uh, are not as productive. So anything we can do to alleviate the cold winter wind um, will help. Will help the, even the summer wind dehydrates the plants. So blocking wind from your crops and your livestock is an important measure. Um, one of the sort of more popular um, forms of of agroforestry is what's called alley cropping. Um, this is where you just take an existing uh, row crop production system and you add these um, rows of trees spaced in a way that you can get your equipment through them in you know, whatever diameter your tractor is, two passes or three passes or however many passes it is, and then still have a row of trees between them. Um, and the reason one would do this is mm -hmm. you get some of that protection um, from from the elements. So it helps uh, it helps with wind and it helps during the, the heat of the summer. It can provide a little uh, relief to the crops. And you're also getting um, two crops instead of one. So you have this long-term investment in the tree crops, whether they're for timber or nuts or whatever it is. And you have your consistent annual production of your of your grain. Um, so you're getting all the benefits of trees, carbon sequestration, creating increased habitat, oxygen production, et cetera, et cetera, um, within your your current cropping system. Um, forest farming is something more popular um, in the Appalachian region where I live. Um, the, the most popular example worldwide is probably uh, shade-grown coffee. And so this is where you're taking um, a mature forest that, that has complete canopy cover, and you're growing shade-loving crops in the um, understory. So uh, around here, people grow uh, medicinal ginseng, um, like wild, wild simulated ginseng, um, can c carry a very good price, and you need shade to do that. So rather than building hoop houses with shade cloth, um, we can have a forest that, you know, allows other things to live in it while also producing a crop. Um, one thing I'm doing is also growing these shiitake mushrooms pictured on the slide. Um, we have an abundance of hardwoods. Um, the shiitake likes white oak in particular, and, and they need shade in order to grow and colonize these logs. So. Um, a lot of opportunities for working with existing farms, including um, rotating hogs into them in the fall, which we'll talk more about later. Um, so mostly what um, what we're going to be talking about in relation to hogs and agroforestry is this idea of silver pasture. And this is um, not to be confused with putting animals into existing woods. It's more adding trees into your pasture. Um, so whether it's for shade or for fodder or just as a scratching post, um, trees have many potential benefits to livestock. Um, 
people often think um, that livestock will necessarily kill kill trees, and it's because they've often seen like a tree in a pasture, and this ends up being where the livestock spend most of their time because of um, they want the shade and they want to scratch against that tree and eventually they'll eat all the bark off of it and, and kill it. So a tree in a pasture often does not survive, but many trees in a pasture um, allow the, the animals to spread out. Um, the trick is to space them wide enough that you can still get full sun to most of the ground and continue to grow um, forage of some kind, whether it's Grass, grass, or any mixed mixed forage. So widely spaced trees planted in your pasture um, provide many potential benefits. Um, sort of combining um, some aspects of all of these is a concept called forest gardening, and this is where you're essentially mimicking the structures and functions of whatever your native ecosystem is. Um, so I live in the eastern deciduous forest. And so I'm trying to sort of model my system off of a young developing woodlot. And a young woodlot has both um, grasses and, and ground cover, and it's got shrubs and brambles, and it has uh, sun-loving tree crops as well. So you get a lot of biomass production each year, a lot of diversity, and a lot of different types of crops. Um, so the, this is a picture from my farm. Here's another another angle. This is a it's about a two and a half or three acre um, fenced in forest garden orchard, and I've got uh, a large variety of crops in here. And I'm gonna play um, play a video that gives gives a little bit of a tour of the the garden. Um, last summer and more fully explains the concept. And after this video, we'll, uh, we'll pause for some questions. So Larissa, if you could. Here at yeah, Solid Ground yeah. Farm, I've developed an agroforestry system or what's sometimes called a forest garden that integrates the native ecology and natural ecosystems with production of tree crops, livestock, and occasional annual vegetables. Um, the idea was to take marginal land. This is a steep hillside that was sort of an overgrown old pasture. It was too steep for me to safely mow. So I uh, installed some terraces to make access paths throughout. There's like five of these on each side. Um, several of them hand dug and some of them done with an excavator. So these provide paths that I can mow. From here I've planted uh, trees along either sides, like this pear. Um, up here we have hazelnut and peaches. Um, all manner of species in here. It's sort of a mix. Every other thing is like apple, hazelnut, peach, mulberry, um, thornless honey locust to fix nitrogen. And then we've got the native species that we use for various projects like the pokeberries for dyes for kids at the summer camp, um, hybrid hazelnuts for us and for the pigs, more pears, and uh, it's just sort of interplanted and then surrounded by native weeds like this iron weed, um, which does a great job of attracting butterflies. Um, it's full of bees, you can almost hear them, particularly on this invasive purple knapweed, um, which the insects love. Raspberries throughout, um, both native and um, cultivars, like this heritage red raspberry. There we go, peaches and mulberry growing together. A lot of disease resistant apples now. We started with Ohio heirloom apples. Um, with which we're having pretty decent success. They're not marketable necessarily, great for cider, um, feeding the kids at the summer camps, and windfalls for the pigs. Um, but they're not completely blemish-free. I don't spray. 
Um, I'll use them for cider or applesauce. Um, and, you know, just browse as I walk through. One of the ideas with the farm is that I wanted the whole place to be sort of a foraging ground year-round. I want to walk around with my family, take the kids from summer camp, and, and pick fresh fruit. So there's apples. This time of year we have apples and pears and peaches. Um, last month it was blackberries. Before that it was raspberries and gooseberries and mulberries. Um, spring herbs earlier and then pretty soon we're going to be getting into the nut season with hickories and chestnuts and walnuts <clears throat> um, so all times of year there's you know there's some wild plant to forage or there's fruit to be picked okay I think I'll stop it there Larissa you can um, check out the, the rest of the video at a link sometime um, but I just wanted to give you guys a sort of look at what I'm doing. Um, that's about a maybe eight-year-old forest garden. I've planted, I don't know, a few hundred trees in there over the last eight years, planting a little more each year. Um, and now I've expanded that concept throughout the rest of my farm and have almost by 10, 10 of the 17 acres planted in, in mixed tree crops of some sort or another. Um, so yeah, this time, if there are any questions. Um, yeah, it looks like yeah. there are a couple that came in. Um, if people do have other questions, you can type them into that chat bar now. If we get to them um, now or we'll, we'll get to them later in the, in the webinar. But one question has to do with going back to the alley cropping and how do you uh, orient it to the four directions? Do you have insight about what works best? Uh, yeah, so I guess ideally you'd orient it uh, east-west so that you get the, you want the sun hitting your crop as much as possible during the day. Um, so the trees would, if the trees are on the north and south sides, it won't get, um, they won't block the sun as much. And then also, you know, maybe you tweak that a little bit depending on the wind direction to sort of block the wind. But um, yeah, generally east-west. Excellent. And then uh, another question I think that um, probably came from your video, how long after you planted the trees and other crops did you, um, after, how long did it take before you let the, the pigs into that area? Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually, I didn't have pigs until um, about four years ago. So a lot of the stuff was at least four or five years, but some of it was only a year or two old. Um, and I've had mixed results, but generally speaking, I'd say that the pigs tend not to disturb um, anything that's been in the ground more than a year. Um, a lot of my planting methods, I, I tend to do a lot of uh, sheet mulching. So when I first plant the tree, I, I put cardboard down and then a bunch of mulch. Um, and if I let the pigs right into that the first year, they'll they'll dig up the mulch because they'll be, you know, grubs and bugs in there. Um, and then maybe in the process, they'll, they'll uproot the tree. Um, but they don't seem to deliberately go after the trees. Mm -hmm. So um, the longer you can give the tree, the better. Um, but I find that two years um, should be enough. Excellent. And one more question for this little section is, how do you get your pigs to come back in at night to a shelter? And do pigs that are left out in the woods, be, have you found them to become aggressive? Um, so I, I do not uh, bring them back each night. When they're in the orchard, they, they sleep um, out under the trees. Um, and it's, they they do not they have not become aggressive. Um, I'm still in there w with them regularly, and um, no, it's not like they've become uh, mm -hmm. feral or anything. They're still being handled, and I move them around every every few weeks to a new spot. And I imagine you'll probably talk a little bit more once we get to this next section about some of the um, ways the that you keep them safe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the in the woods. Um, yeah, so why don't we keep going and we'll get to other questions as, as we can. Great. Okay, so, um, yes, bringing the pigs into this uh, forest garden situation um, has been a great use for 
the large abundance of of food created by by such a system. Um, I my initial goal was I just wanted to um, grow grow food for the 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 fun of growing it. And once there was more than I could use, um, I needed a way to um, convert it into something useful. Um, so I do a little apple cider and some preserving, um, but found that the pigs were a great way to um, convert, especially low low quality fruit, which unfortunately in my area it's pretty hard to grow like a bl blemish free apple without pesticides. And I I haven't had the interest in regularly spraying my trees, so they get bugs and they get diseases and um, sometimes you know they're not they're not the the best thing. So um, the pigs do a great job of just like taking that excess food and making it into something valuable. Um, once I sort of developed that strategy, I I started deliberately planting more things for the pigs. Um, so sort of moved away from more finicky crops like apples and peaches and started doing more things like mulberries and Chinese chestnuts and hazelnuts and sort of annually productive crops that have low um, pest and disease issues, need little fertilization, and produce like consistently abundant crops. Um, and then any chance I get, I incorporate the children, get them excited about interacting. Um, the mulberries have been the, the biggest success on my farm in a number of aspects from being the favorite of my children um, to also being the favorite of the pigs and the kids at the summer camp. Uh, I found that the, the leaves are also highly palatable for livestock and I go around and strip the branches um, twice a year and feed those to the pigs. Um, they're really high in protein and very digestible. Um, that's Morris alba and Morris alba hybrid species. Um, yeah, so yeah, just, you know, pictures of fruit. Um, we had a really good peach year last year. Um, the pigs must have eaten several hundred pounds of, of peaches. Um, so a little bit about my, my pig operation. It's, it's pretty small scale. Um, I, I just, I've been getting like eight feeder pigs a year. Um, and then rotating them through pasture and orchard, depending on the season. Um, so um, I do want to distinguish between a lot of people, there's this great idea of raising pigs in the forest, um, which is a tradition, especially in Appalachia. In the fall, hog farmers would turn their pigs loose among like thousands of acres of hardwood forest, and they would just glean all the mast from the ground and fatten themselves on Chinese chestnuts and oaks and hickories and all this stuff. Um, and that is great when you have hundreds of acres of land. Um, however, most of us don't have that luxury anymore. And even if we do it, did, it's only a good resource seasonally. Um, there's a lot less food for pigs in a mature forest during the spring and summer. Um, that mass production is really the main appeal. Um, you can bring your your animals in earlier, and they can find grubs and and some undergrowth to eat. Um, but if they're just in the forest year round, um, they'll probably end up doing more damage than good. And that's sort of the real the real challenge is having the animals in the right place at the right time for the right duration. Um, and that's something um, that just takes, I guess, some observation and practice. Um, general rule of thumb, you know, it always depends on the situation, but anywhere from 10 to 20 pigs per acre. Um, and that is if you are regularly moving them to new pasture. Um, and a great way that um, Joel Salatin does this, you know, 10, 10 piglets is different than 10 uh, 250 pound sows. So um, how he moves his pigs 
is he fills a, a two-ton pig feeder with corn, and by the time it's gone, it's time to move the pigs to a new um, half-acre paddock. So he he divides, I think, two acres up into several, maybe it's quarter-acre paddocks, puts in the two um, the two tons of feed, and then by the time it's gone, he moves them to the next the next half half acre or quarter acre paddock. Um, and that way they get about the same amount of pressure on each space. Um, so pigs will invariably do some disturbance to the land. Uh, they love to root. They spend, I think, almost half of their day digging in some manner, sniffing, you know, using their noses. Um, so regardless of how much space you have and how many pigs, um, there will be some um, some digging. Um, and that can stimulate regrowth of, of beneficial species. It sort of awakens the seed bed um, if done for, for the right amount of time. And he thinks the right amount of time is, is one, one feeder full. Other people say, um, you know, 10 pigs on a half acre for two weeks is a good rule of thumb. Um, but again, it depends on the land, the quality of the forage, et cetera. And that's assuming um, you're providing free choice supplemental feed. Um, so my, my system is a little bit different than these conventional um, pasture pig operations where, where the, you're, you're offering free choice feed and sort of supplementing with the pasture. I'm trying to replace as much of my feed with forage, be that fruit or nuts um, or whatever seasonally available food I have. Um, so I feed a ration um, on days when there is not a significant supply of, of fresh food for them. And on days w or months when there is food available, I, I don't feed them additionally. Um, so I'm going to show a little video here of a little bit of my my operation, and then we'll take questions again afterwards about about what we just watched. So, Larissa, if, if you could key this one up, that would be great.
just shook the apple tree here. Fruit is falling at the moment. A lot of the productive for the native habitat. The trees provide shade for the pigs, food, everything they need. Some apple pomace, some little fish, and a pig feeding frenzy. Great. So maybe we'll open it up to, to questions again. Um, just to answer a few questions um, that people wrote in early, um, we do use we use two strands of um, electric. Um, we got like a solar electric charger, and we we set up I set up sort of large paddocks, like maybe an acre at a time, um, and leave them there until most of the food is gone. Um, so it's more it just it depends it depends on what what I've fenced in. Sometimes I'll put them in a little existing like acorn glen, and they'll eat all the acorn or sorry walnuts. They'll eat all the walnuts in like five days, and then I'll move them on um, to a new to a new place. And then when there isn't any food, I have sort of a sacrifice pasture that's up on top of the ridge, and I I put them in there. Um, and, and feed them a regular grain ration until there's some more food available. Okay, Chris, Larissa, do you have sure. any questions? Yeah, there are a couple questions that came in. Um, uh, one of our audience members wanted to know if you could share thoughts on managing pigs in planting of lumber trees. In planting of lumber trees? Planting, yeah, I guess among um, lumber trees. Oh, among lumber trees. Um, so uh, I found that pigs do an excellent job of sort of clearing the ground around my trees. Even, even things like uh, raspberries and little shrubs, they'll generally eat the herbaceous layer and leave the trees alone. Like I said, once they're established for a year or two. Um, so I bring my pigs into an area to sort of to do the the maintenance for me, and they'll clear out. A lot of the underbrush, um, if you leave them in even longer, they will like completely till up the soil if you have enough pigs in a small enough area. And at that point, um, it's, it's sort of prepared for, for planting. So if you, you could use them to clear an area and then plant into it, um, give the trees a few years to establish, um, and then reintroduce the pigs seasonally um, to do the maintenance. So ideally, they would be timber trees that also have some sort of mass production, which most, I think, do. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question about what uh, what breed of pig do you prefer or like? Um, I've been really happy with, I've got some Tamworth. Uh, I think they're maybe a quarter blue butt or, or something like that. Um, I have a a friend who also does this, and he's just lent me his uh, large black uh, boar to breed my my Tamworth, and um, I'm hoping that that cross works out well. But um, I think yeah, any of the uh, I've heard uh, people using old spots and uh, red wattles do really well in this type of situation. Mostly, you just you don't want like a a pink. Uh, modern meat pig, just because they they can sunburn and they sort of weren't don't have a history of of foraging. But most older breeds do pretty well. Excellent. Thank, and forest. thank you. Going back to the um, 
another question about your fencing um, in particular, how far apart are the strands of fencing and how high off the ground are they? Um, so it actually didn't show it in the in the video, but I'm actually I'm running them with sheep as well. Um, and part of a part of my spacing is based on on the, I don't want the sheep to be able to jump over it. But mostly you want you want something at like snout level, um, and that changes with the the age of the pigs. You can when the pigs are are big, 150 pounds or more, you can just have one one strand of electric at, at snout level. Um, but when they have piglets with them as well, or when when the pigs are smaller, you want one down. Um, I don't I don't tend to put it lower than a foot off the ground just because it'll often then hit the, the grass below it and, and short it out a little bit. So I, maybe I put one at a foot and one at like two and a half feet. I'm just sort of guessing there, but um, yeah, I don't know. If a pig really wants to, I've heard they can jump three feet. <laughs> okay, I think that's, um, I think we can keep going. Finish up the presentation. Great. Okay, so um, I guess uh, important things to include in um, when you are rotating the pigs, um, they, they always need, need water. Um, and if there's not, a wallow in the area, they will use their drinking water as the wallow, as many of you have probably observed if you have pigs. Um, so I, in my pasture, I've, I've created their like sacrifice pasture. Um, it has a wallow sort of in the, in the center. And I tend to like radially um, make paddocks off of that. Um, so, if I'm just feeding the pigs, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have make sure they have access to their wallow and access to feed and uh, some sort of shelter. And having that all in the middle and then making little half acre paddocks off of that is a great way to move them around. Um, however, once they're in an area with more trees, I don't even bring the shelters with me anymore. If there's trees, they can get shade underneath a tree. Um, I even, yeah, even through the, the fall and into the winter, um, the large pigs, like they'll be out um, in a forested situation without additional shelter. Um, and no, that's not true. If it's really cold, I'll build them a sort of a straw bale structure of some sort um, for the cold, but, but the sun isn't an issue. Okay, so moving on, if I were going to, um, design a system from scratch, um, I would try to create it such that I could move my pigs through the season into an area with fresh fruit or nuts or ground covers every time of the year. Um, so I'd have like a designated spring, spring area where I'm going to um, have the pigs for the first few months of the year. And in there, um, you'd want just like really nice pasture. Um, pigs can get, I've read from like 25 to 30% of their dietary needs just from like mixed grasses. Um, planting uh, other forages in there as well, um, adding like turnips and radishes and other root vegetables. Um, putting in a lot of clovers and other high protein things, um, a lot of brassicas, like getting in, you know, kale and cabbage and all this stuff. Um, you can actually, if you want, grow most of your pig's uh, nutritional requirements um, just from uh, vegetables. Um, and that I've read, I don't, I don't have, a, you know, it's hard to know this stuff for sure, but people say it takes about four pounds of like fruit and vegetables to get nutritionally and calorically the, the same benefit you get from one pound of, of commercial feed ration. Um, so you have to produce um, a lot more mass, um, but um, that is, is easily achievable. So as they move into summer, then you get a lot more um, 
a lot more potential from the tree crops. Uh, mulberries in particular are, are my favorite. Um, for one, uh, many species can like bear continuously for um, two, two months or more um, every day dropping a few more mulberries on the ground. And uh, this from, from this book, uh, Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith, he talks about um, pigs just hanging out under mulberry trees for several months in the summer and getting fat exclusively on, on mulberries as they fall. Um, so I've been experimenting a lot, planting a bunch of different varieties into my pasture, and I'm hoping that almost the sole food, for, food source will be, will be mulberry. It looks like um, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to speed through this. Um, but there's great native things in the video. We saw them eating some giant ragweed. Um, it's a native plant, sort of known for its noxious pollen. Um, but again, it's really high in protein and is nutritionally sort of equivalent to alfalfa. Um, so letting them loose in the ragweed patch is a great way to both control it and get some free food for the pigs. And then fall is really where um, they do great in the woods, eating walnuts, hickories, acorns. Um, I put a star next to chestnuts and hazelnuts because of those listed, these ones are actually um, annual producers, whereas acorns might produce once every five years, and walnuts, you know, could be three to five years. So you don't you don't get the consistency you need to to count on having a food supply. So um, Chinese chestnuts are a great fast-growing tree, produce a ton, of, a ton of nuts that just fall right from the tree and the pigs can walk around and harvest them. Uh, Badger Set Research Corporation is doing some great research on chestnuts and pigs. And uh, so is uh, Mark Shepard is growing hazelnuts and chestnuts for pigs as well. Um, and then there's a lot of late apples and pears. Um, again, I'm, I'm sort of now focusing on just not necessarily the most delicious or good looking apple, but just something that produces a lot of of biomass, so a lot of apples um easily without pesticides and that sort of thing and then, yeah, towards the end of the year, you might be getting back into some of the cool season grasses and forage um and there's native fruits like persimmons and pawpaws um and another great option. Um, one of the great things about bringing pigs into an orchard, whether so it, a lot of uh, traditional use of pigs in like an apple orchard is even apples that fell earlier in the summer and haven't been cleaned up, um, you can bring the pigs in in the winter and they'll find all the mushy, rotten apples and eat eat everything they can get their hands on. And this helps clean up the orchard floor and so breaks some like disease cycles. They'll eat any pests that are overwintering in the fruit um, and just generally improve your orchard health as well as they fertilize and, and clear out the, the understory. Um, so that can be done even though the fruit might fall in the summer or the fall, you can still bring your pigs in in the winter and they'll eat any old fruit that they can find. Um, and that's generally... Um, that's generally what I'm trying to do. Just I want to um, encourage beneficial species that have some multiple functions. So a lot of these things I'm growing for the pigs, but anything that I can reach myself, um, I harvest for, for sale or personal use. I just have to make sure I don't um, harvest things that have fallen on the ground. So I have to pick directly from the tree if I want to use it because there is you know, pig poop throughout. So that is one one sort of concern. Here they are in the ragweed again in this slide. And again, uh, mulberry. I, I wrote a little booklet, booklet that you can check out in the in the link below, and it'll tell you why I think mulberries are such a important food source for people and livestock. Um, and here's some slides about why maybe mulberry isn't such a, a well-known, well-known crop. And this is just uh, 
some of my propagation work. I, I've I've gotten a few grants from uh, SAIR, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. They do uh, grants for farmers and ranchers who want to do um, education and research programs in sustainable agriculture. Um, so I got some to install those terraces and sort of research a um, terrace production system. And then I have all gotten another one to uh, plant a few mulberry orchards on my property and test different varieties for temperate regions. Um, so there's surprisingly about 50 varieties of mulberries that can be grown in relatively cold climates um, that produce you know, edible fruit and leaves um, and have great medicinal qualities as well. This is my little nursery um, getting started. And that's, I think that's it. Thank you for, for joining us. If you have additional questions, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, thank you so much, Weston. Um, it was really fantastic. We didn't get to that final video, but I will be sending that out along with all the other follow-up information. Um, we probably do have uh, time for one or two more questions if, if you do have a burning, um, a burning question. Um, so one question we did receive was, why distinguish between raising animals in existing and possibly selectively thinned woods and in pastures that have trees added to them? Um, yeah, great question. So um, I guess it is, it's great bringing pigs into existing woodlots. Um, I think my, my point was just that they only typically have a seasonal benefit, like you bring them in the fall and the winter to get the nuts. Um, but during the spring and summer, there's not a lot of um, forage in there. If you do thin, however, to let light in, um, the pigs can disturb the soil and awaken some like dormant dormant seeds and encourage grass to grow in there and you can sort of create a silvopasture situation out of an existing mature forest. Um, and that's yeah, just an, another approach to establishing a silvopasture, which is, is just as good. Um, I think maybe my focus on going from pasture to silvopasture is just trying to encourage people to plant more trees, um, to get more of these um, ecosystem services, sequester more carbon, stabilize the soil, whereas these functions are already being performed pretty well in an existing forest. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm trying to sort of convert my, for, for my farm from pasture to uh, savanna-like woodland. Thank you, thank you. Okay, one last quick question before we finish up is, um, do you think that these pigs, uh, or have you seen them clear blackberry, blackberry bushes? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, I bet if you left them in long enough in a small enough area, they would, um, but uh, no, they, they, <laughs> they have not helped me with my blackberry. I have successfully used uh, pigs in combination with sheep to uh, deal with um, a lot of uh, vine honeysuckle um, and some other invasive species as well. So I, fi I find a good a combination of a, a grazer and a, a pig can do a lot of a lot of good in clearing land. Great, that's that's wonderful information. Um, so I do have a few housekeeping items to share before we sign off. As I mentioned earlier, a recording of this webinar and the presentation slides will be available soon. Hopefully, I'll get that sent out to you all this afternoon. Um, these documents will also be archived on our website. Um, and I'd like to invite you to join us for a future webinar. We have a couple great ones coming up that just got um, listed. One coming up on May 2nd that's going to focus on land access issues. And whether you're a new, beginning, or established farmer, we hope that this webinar will help you navigate the issues around accessing farmland, um, including leasing, ownership, and finding lands. And then later in May, we're going to offer a session about the nutritional benefits of pasture-raised animals, as well as one about how to create a forage chain for your livestock. So all of our webinars are free, and you can register for as many or as few as you like. So I'm afraid that's all the time that we have today. Um, I 
like to give a sincere thank you to you, Weston, for your wonderful presentation and for taking the time to answer all of our questions and sharing your expertise. And a thank you to all of um, all of our audience members for your attention and your interest. Um, I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon and that we all connect um, again soon. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for having me.